Hi everybody, it's Stephen Brook and welcome to Architectural Photography and Composition. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you've been here before, we're, we've discussed some of these issues, but I want to go over them in a bit more orderly way. Without a doubt, the most difficult thing we do as architectural photographers is to photograph interiors, whether it's residential or commercial or industrial. This is the most difficult aspect of our work. And frankly, I know a number of photographers who do rather well outside, but when they come inside, don't do as well. So what I want to do is I want to give you an organized way to look at photographing interiors. I'm sure you've had the a situation where you go in and your client immediately said, well, we have put the books here. Do we need the flowers over here? What about the and you haven't even you haven't even decided where you're going to photograph from. So I want to offer my way of approaching interiors. And I do this, it doesn't matter whether it's residential interior or commercial or industrial. I pretty much do this the same way. Now, if you are completely new to interior design or don't have much background, this is one book that I recommend. This is by my friend Stanley Abercrombie um, and Cheryl Witten. It's Interior Design and Decoration. You can get fourth, fifth, sixth edition. It, any of them are really good. And I think it's wonderful to have as a reference. And plus, it gives you more vocabulary when you talk about interiors with your clients. Now, we've looked at the work of Vermeer and we've looked at Sanradam and we've looked at Edward Hopper and all that they have to offer us in planning and in figuring out the kinds of compositions that work for interiors. So what I want to do now is I would like to give you what is my basic interiors workflow. This is the way I approach any of my work and I pretty much do it the same way every time. So number one is to determine the best time of day for your room. This is really important. You can be a daytime shot and if it's daytime, soft indirect light is one one situation you may have another really high contrast direct light. And we've looked at paintings by Hopper to show how he handles this really intense lighting. Breakfast rooms, for example, they're typically on the east side of a house. The light comes in in the morning and those are typically photographed during the day or during the early morning. Nighttime shots require a lot of planning, a lot of care. And we've talked about that in night photography. Um, here are two examples of Suzanne Martinson Architects and uh, Rafael Portuando's group showing this, obviously this interior looking out over the ocean, this one looking off into the canal. Typically dining rooms are photographed at night and you want to plan for that ahead of time in terms of what you want on the table, how the lighting is going to work. And some rooms, when you see them, you can see, well, these are going to make great daytime shots, but also really good night shots. And if you can look and see what kind of overhead lights you have, for example, here you've got chandeliers. Here you've got down lights in the ceiling. These give you great opportunities to have beautifully lit interiors. Here's another example. This is a, a house by the water uh, by, by Rafael Portuando. Here's a daytime shot. It has one kind of mood. And of course, a night shot has another kind of mood. And both of them work. One of the reasons is that people enjoy those rooms at these different times of day. And as a photographer, what you want to do is is not just do this clinically, but to show the lifestyle of these rooms. Number two, determine the best geometry. So start with the axial view, particularly if it's a complicated interior. We talked about signature shots in architecture that there's one view of a of a of a piece of architecture that shows as much as possible the siting, the materials, the play of light. There's always one signature shot. And I 
and the same thing is true for interiors. And one of the things you want to do when you're looking for the best geometry is to find that one signature shot and then you work the rest of your documentation around that one main shot, whether or not it's residential or educational. This is out of Miami Dade and the new AI labs or commercial. This is a uh, restaurant by uh, Burton Hirsch. And notice in one of our videos, we talked about the power of vertical elements to anchor a composition. And I've used that here. I've used this decorative cactus as my big vertical element to balance everything else in the room. Retail retail typically those those areas are pretty dense. Their retail stores have a lot to show and an axial composition is usually a way to organize all of that information. Number three, determine the best eye height. And this is a sore spot because I see so many photographs, particularly in the real estate industry, where the camera is simply up too high. And if you're using a wide angle lens, you're going to get wicked distortion. So what is the rule? Place the camera no higher than is necessary to adequately see the tops of the tables and to separate the key elements in the room. Notice I'm just at a point where I can see the table and a little space underneath here where I can see the rug. This obelisk is high enough to break the plane of the couch back here. This, break, this sets the break front even further back. Everything I'm doing is to create a sense of depth. Remember a three-dimensional world translated into two dimensions. You want to try to have as much depth in your picture as possible. So items are in front of or behind one another or clearly separated, but almost never tangential because that ruins the sense of depth. Now, I've mentioned this before, rather than starting up high and, and moving down, I start lower than I need to be and I bring my camera up to just where everything really locks into place. Avoid this kind of look. Here the camera is up too high and it's off axis and the table is, out, is, is distorted. And what's worse is the furniture and the chairs and all look like they're sliding off the page. So try to avoid that kind of look, especially if you're using a wide angle lens, 24 millimeter, 17 millimeter, something like that. Number four, arrange the elements. Notice we've gone through three steps before we actually start doing the decorating and start doing the arrangement. Do your largest items first, big tables, big chairs, couches, and all that. And then you figure out how the detail, what, what the little accessories are, where they're going to go. Remember again, everything is compositional. So in this interior, I set the chair, set the table, and then every one of these little areas here, 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 each one of these is its own little still life. And I have a deep dive on still life photography, and I think you'll enjoy. This is a pretty intense video. There's a lot going on, and I talk about a way historically um, how still life has been treated, and then what you as a photographer can do to practice doing still life. Now, if you have an interior with only a few items, you have to be really precise and really careful in, in what you arrange. Here's this table. I only have three sets of books, the one humidor here, and I've got them pretty carefully arranged so that the negative space reads as its own form, gives you room to come in here. The chairs are set just right. So there aren't many things here. They have to be set just so as opposed to a room like this in Mark Hampton's house where there are a lot of elements and they all need to be arranged relative to one another. Typically, I will start with the foreground after I set the big pieces and I will work on the foregrounds accessories and move further back until everything works just fine. Remember in front of behind separate, but not touching. 
Here, for example, I've used the piano and this piece of artwork, like the verticals, the power verticals that I've shown you before, to frame my interior rather than let the windows just carry out. I've got a vertical here to hold your eye in. And I've got part of the piano turns you this way, part of the piano turns you now back this way. So I direct your eye just like I want to direct your eye when I'm doing an exterior or a landscape. Remember, that's so important that you keep your viewer's eye on the frame. Number five, control the lighting. This is again, super important. I have a video on this, lights on for better daylight interior photographs. And I will say again, not every photographer agrees with me in doing this, but I have set out why I think this is important in this video lights on. Turn the lights on for daylight shots. That's what I do. Make sure all the burned out bulbs are replaced. Make sure this is something you just don't do. No candles during the day. Frankly, it's considered a little tacky. Time your session to the available light. If you have strong daylight coming into the room, you know you're going to probably have to layer those exposures. Generally, light bulbs that are 60, 75 watts have a tendency to overexpose. It's going to force you to layer. And avoid really bright lights that are close to the camera, just like you would avoid the sun coming into your lens. Be careful that you don't have lights close to the camera sending a halation, making a halation on your lens. You have to be really careful if you've got a bright light that's close that it isn't getting right into your lens. It will soften it up, it will take out some of the contrast, and it won't look good. Now, natural daylight like we see in Vermeer, that's a pretty standard kind of situation that you can have. So this is what I had in um, an interior that I did for Furlough Gatewood in uh, Georgia. Combining incandescent with evening light requires really precise timing. And at this point in the, situ in the condition, the white balance has to be changed to tungsten to make sure the interior reads properly and you get this nice, rich, deep blue in the background. Check the focus. I stop down at least to F16 and usually to F22 when I'm shooting interiors. I want maximum depth of field. I am not looking for an artistic shot where I have something in the foreground and everything else is blurred out the, the way I might want that for, let's say, a portrait. This is not what we're doing. We want as much in focus as possible. Typically, I start my focus about a third of the way into the frame. I use live view and a loop. And if you have a depth of field preview button to stop down your lens, you can see what's in focus. And I use a, um, a little, I use cards and I use various things to make sure that I'm absolutely in focus. Now, if you're in a situation where you have near to far and, it, and it, it's a big distance, you can get away with a little bit of foreground, near foreground out of focus if everything else is in wire sharp focus. The opposite isn't true. If this is in focus and your back wall is out, that's not going to be, it's not a good photograph for what we're doing in documenting interiors. Then finally, you have everything set. Now's the time to expose your frames. Interior exposure requires a lot of care. The contrast range is pretty wide, especially if you have light coming into the windows and in the same room, let's say you have dark furniture, that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty wide contrast range. And balancing interior and exterior light is difficult, but you have to do it. And the way I want you to approach this is to pre-visualize when you know you're going to have to layer. And you can see, well, the lights are going to be pretty bright. I'm going to need an underexposed shot to capture the window, and I'm going to need a normal exposure for the room, and I'm going to need a brighter one, let's say, for the dark furniture. So let's see what that looks like. 
Now, when you meter, if you have really dark objects or really pow light pounding in, even these really great meters in the camera can be fooled a little bit, which is why I recommend whatever your central reader meter, meter reading is, you go everywhere from three full stops under to three full stops over. Yes, you're going to get a lot of junk, but in that spread, especially if you have to layer, you're going to find exactly the exposure that you're going to need. And rather than try to guess at what that's going to be, you make a wide bracket and then go in bridge and pick out the ones that work. So this is a this is typical. I pulled some um, selections from an entire exposure sequence. This is about here's here's a basic middle reading somewhere around here. This is about three stops under, but it's what I need to get something in the window. Here are exposures for the room itself. And then here's a overexposed except for this chair and then Here's my final photograph and I use when I have more than two images, if I have three or four or five images to blend, I do use the program Luminar Neo, which is a beautiful program. It does a great job of if you have slight misalignment, hopefully not, but if you have slight misalignment, it does the aligning for you and it's flawless and it has a great set of camera raw uh, tools just like regular camera raw. And so I use that after I pick out my um, exposures and I'll bring them into Luminar Neo and layer them. Avoid blown out windows, please. I don't care what the current ethos is. Well, it's OK. It's sort of natural. No, it's artless. Don't do that. Designers, good designers, good architects plan the views out of the window. The really good ones will plan the landscape so that when their client is sitting in the living room looking out of the window, they know what they're going to see. They plan the landscape or they plan the view. And it's your job as a photographer to show that. So if the windows are blasted out and you can't see anything, you haven't you haven't done the job. You haven't shown what the designer and or architect were trying to do when they laid out the rooms. So avoid that. And this usually if it's this bright, it's going to require layering and you plan that ahead of time. But please avoid blown out windows. It's not a good this style is going to be over soon. I hope it doesn't matter. This is the right thing to do. If you have a new camera and you haven't you're not used to using it or whatever in the process of setting everything up and taking your exposures, there is always a chance slight chance that you might have moved your focus when you've taken your, your images. The best and if it's out of focus, that's the end of it. No program is going to really help you that much. Double check your focus and make sure it's exactly where it was when you started. If it is great you're done. If not, you need to go back and redo them and make sure you don't hit your focusing ring accidentally. So let's review. Determine the best time of day for the room. Determine the best position for your signature shot and start from there. I recommend an axial view to start with. Then determine the best eye height. Then arrange all your elements. Start with the big stuff first. And if you're not sure about a table, take everything off the table and see what it looks like. Does it look bare? OK, where does it look bare? Well, it could use a book here. Then you put a book. Well, maybe you need something here. That's the way that you slowly build it up like a still life. Control your lighting. Once you have everything set, determine how you want to use your lights. And that also means figuring out ahead of time, pre visualizing whether or not you're going to have to layer. Check the focus. I use live view and a loop to make sure it's wire sharp from front to back and you can take an exposure and preview it, zoom in on it in camera and make sure everything is exactly in focus. And then expose using as using a wide bracket and anticipate layering.
It's complicated. Doing interiors is not easy. It takes more time, more moving parts. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Our videos are always going to be free. If you would like to help support the site and get something really good for not a lot of money, I consider purchasing a copy of Architectural Photography and Composition, my ebook, that has basically everything you need to either fine tune what you already know, or if you're just starting out from beginning to end, you, come out, you will come out of this book with the ability to do professional quality photographs. I guarantee it. And um, you can read some of the critiques that um, we've gotten. And I've had people that have been professional, they've been working for years, said this book really helped me. So for $9.99, cost you less than lunch, you can get a complete guide to architectural photography. We talk about exteriors, interiors, everything. One of the things that I have in this book is an appendix, Preparation for Photography Guidelines, and it includes what I send my clients, for them to send their clients, freer, for example, the things that I expect them to have ready ahead of time on interiors, so that when I get there, I can just concentrate on doing photography work rather than maid work. So th this is one of the appendices in here. Now, the book, you, you will go through the, the steps and everything in the book on your own. If you would like what is really a, a guided tour through all of this, we have now an online course with Udemy, Fundamentals of Architectural Photography and Composition. It's a 46 lesson course that takes you from beginning to end. And I guarantee you again, when you go through this course, you will come out with all the confidence in the world to do this work at a professional level. Everything in everything that I do in the field is in that book. I've left nothing out. There are no tricks that I have that I haven't included in this course. And it takes you step by step in the field, on a screen, everything. And we even talk about business and how to run a photog an architectural photography business. I think you will find this invaluable, particularly if you are just starting out in this field or you're a seasoned photographer and are now deciding to go into architectural photography. So consider purchasing a copy of the book or even better, purchasing a copy of the online course. So thank you for watching. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.